All right, welcome to the Growing Great Citrus Workshop. And uh, for anybody who's a father out there, happy Father's Day tomorrow. Um, for Father's Day weekend, I know if you read our newsletter, uh, my dad and I love citrus trees for my whole life. But the property I grew up on, we had at least a dozen different citrus. My grandmother had a citrus grove. I, the tree I always remember, because I used to mow her yard for even as I got into my early 20s, was this grapefruit tree that was like 30 feet wide and 20 feet tall. You've never seen so many grapefruit. I mean, there's just no way that even the whole family could eat all those grapefruits. So I've always grown up with citrus and I really love citrus. And I, so I hope that I can share some of my great tips with you today, uh, how to take care of your citrus, how to get them started. We'll kind of go through the whole process of what's important for keeping them happy and healthy. Um, there are a lot of you here today. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm gonna give you my workshop, give you all the information I have. Um, I'm not gonna take questions during uh, the seminar. But afterwards, I promise I will answer questions for as long as you have them. Uh, if you've got individual questions about your trees, uh, they may pertain to someone else, so I'll be happy to answer those. But we'll save those for at the end of the workshop. So if you do come up with a question while I'm talking, just jot it down. And uh, at the end, I promise I'll answer all of your questions uh, as long as I still have a voice. So welcome. And we're going to get started uh, learning about citrus trees. So who has a favorite citrus? Anybody have a favorite? Mine was grapefruit. I was kind of spoiler, right? Grapefruits, yeah. A grapefruit a day keeps the doctor away, right? Unless you're taking cholesterol medicine and they tell you you can't, right? What's your favorite? Shout it. Tangerines. Oh, I love a good tangerine with a zipper skin. There's all sorts of great citrus. Um, although they're all pretty similar um, in terms of like the tang that they have and things like that, there's a lot of variety, right? Lemons and limes, great for cooking, for drinks, for pies, um, oranges for juice tangelos, tangerines for eating out of hand, and uh, grapefruits, of course, and, and there's all sorts of kind of funky citrus in between. So lots of different uh, options when it comes to growing citrus. And Florida is a wonderful place for growing the majority of citrus varieties. So, you know, really you just have to pick the kind that you like, look at your yard, determine if you've got the space or not, and you can grow just about any kind of citrus here in the state of Florida. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through kind of the instructions we would give you for starting new citrus, for getting them planted and getting them started. And then we'll turn it over to caring for citrus. Um, and that'll apply to, you know, trees that you already have, new trees that you're planting, or even old ones if you have them still in your yard. So that's how we'll kind of go through this. And hopefully we get you lots of great information for taking care of your citrus trees. So the first thing we want to do when we're going to plant a citrus tree is we want to pick a spot for it, right? What do we think citrus want to be? In the sun. In the sun, right? Can they take shade? No. Are citrus houseplants? Um, citrus want to be in a nice sunny area. It has to have at least six hours of sun. There's just no question about that. Any less than that, oh, the tree might survive, but it's going to be lanky. It's not going to grow well, and it's not going to flower or fruit well. So make sure that the space you're going to use has at least six hours of direct sunlight. And when we say at least, you know, you heard me say six, so now you're going to go look at your yard for that perfect spot that only has six hours. Remember, I said six or more. So citrus are actually really happy with all day sun. So from sun up to sundown, if they get sun, that's fantastic for them. They'll fruit, flower, and grow really well in that kind of an area. But since a lot of us deal with trees and houses that shade particular parts of our areas, we say at least six. So we want to make sure it's at least a good direct six hours. Doesn't matter what time of day is, for some types of when we're talking about veggies and herbs and things like that, sometimes we'll talk about doing it in morning sun so it's not as intense. Citrus don't care. They want good sun. It could be afternoon sun, morning sun, as long as it's a good full six hours through the day. The second thing you want to think about with your citrus trees when you're picking a location um, is to make sure it's a well-drained area. Citrus want plenty of sunlight. They don't want to sit wet um, at all. So citrus love a good sandy soil. How many people, when you walk out in your backyard, have just rich, loamy, dense topsoil? It's perfect for planting and growing everything. I want to know where you live because I'm gonna, I, yeah. I want that house. Yeah. Uh, most of us don't have great soil in our backyards. Uh, in fact, yeah. for a lot of us, if we're in what was a citrus grove 20 or 30 years ago, it's probably pretty sandy. Um, they use that sandy soil because it's actually not terrible for the citrus because it drains really well. So we always hate that sand when we go to dig because we know it doesn't have that much richness. We're going to have to add that back a little bit for our citrus trees. But the good thing about sand is that it does drain well. What do we get a lot of in Florida at this time of the year? We get a lot of rain, right? Heavy rains. And the sand drains well. If you have a thick, dense soil or kind of a heavy clay of any sort, 
it's gonna be soggy all the time, and that's not good for citrus. So when you're picking your location for your citrus, you want it to be a well-drained area, somewhere where even after a really heavy afternoon rainstorm, by the next day it's dried off pretty well. You don't want a place that sits wet, definitely not a place with any kind of standing water. Um, so make sure that it drains well. And then the third thing I'd encourage you to think about if you're planting a new citrus tree is just to think about how you're going to water it. We're gonna, I'll lecture you on watering in a little bit. Um, but here when you're picking the location, make sure that you have a good plan for keeping it watered. It's just a little bit more than my lawn sprinklers might hit it. Um, make sure that either a hose is nearby, you can put it onto your irrigation system in some way with a bubbler, because as much as citrus want to be in a well-drained area, kind of dry out between waterings, they do need plenty of good deep water to get them established and keep them growing. So you just, that's always a consideration when you're planting something is how am I going to take care of it? And since watering is the most important, I say think about that when you're choosing the location for your citrus trees. Okay, so once we've got that location selected, we know it's a nice sunny area, we need to get the tree planted. And as we just said, most of us have really sandy soil uh, in our backyards. It's not ideal for citrus. What kind of soil do you think they're growing in in these pots here? Florida sand? No, you've planted trees and shrubs before. It's in a pretty good rich soil in those pots, right? So the trees growing in the pots, they're used to a good rich soil. They are not used to our native Florida soil. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we amend the planting hole just a little bit to make sure that they can get used to what's there without having to do it all at once. So when we're planting, we wanna dig nice wide holes, about at least twice as wide as the pot size that we're planting from. So there's a couple of the five gallon citrus here in front of me. So that's a five gallon pot's usually about 14, 12, to, or 12 inches across. And so we're gonna dig a hole out about maybe 18 to 20 inches across when we're planting a five gallon citrus. That's at a minimum. Dig as wide as you want, but what do we not wanna do with any of our plants and trees? Dig deep. Biggest problem with planting trees or planting shrubs is digging too deep. I know you get excited when that shovel gets in your hand and you just start digging and digging and digging, all of a sudden you got a really deep hole. Uh, but that's not great for plants, especially because we're Florida, because it's wet a lot with the rain, we want the plants to be able to dry out well. When they're buried under soil, uh, that doesn't allow them to dry out, makes them the low point in the area where the water collects, and it's just a recipe for a slow demise of any of your plants and trees. So our rule of thumb with any of your trees and plants, but especially with citrus, is that once you have planted a tree or a shrub, when you look at the ground, you should still see what was at the top of the plant when it was in the pot. Might be a little bit of roots at the top, little fertilizer balls that are on there or something like that. Whatever it is, you should still see it. Plants should be planted level with the existing ground. So for anything that you plant, always think nice wide hole, but not deeper. Now for citrus in particular, because we wanna make sure they drain well, we will typically plant our citrus a half inch to even an inch above the existing level of the ground. I'm not gonna mound them up all crazy. We're not trying to make a mountain out of it, but just a little bit higher than the existing ground, and that makes them the higher point in the area around them. That way when we do get a heavy rain, the water's gonna soak into the, you know, the root ball, the root area of the tree, but then the excess water can move away from it so that they do have a chance to dry out in between each one of those rains or waterings. So planting a little bit on the high side for citrus trees is important. Honestly, any of your fruit trees you should do that with. Um, what's really, really bad for the trees, and I think there's a, a misconception about what to do with the dirt, is that, you know what, I, want my, I don't want my tree to fall over. So I'm gonna dig a nice deep hole, and I'm gonna pile some dirt back up over the top of it, and that weight from that extra soil is gonna, one, cover the roots that are there, because sometimes we're nervous that those roots wanna be underground, and then second, that that weight's gonna keep it from falling over. And unfortunately, that's just really, really bad for the trees. They have picked uh, a particular level to be at. Those roots at the surface are actually trying to get a little bit of air for themselves. And in particular, with citrus, they like to do that. Have you ever seen those, um, oh, it's a farm machine, what are they called? Just, they're discs. So you just pull behind a tractor and there's like a row of discs and they kind of aerate the top level of the soil. They do that a lot in the citrus groves and they're actually chopping some of those surface roots to increase the aeration. Citrus have a lot of surface roots at the top. And so it, you, you look at the top of the pot and you see those roots and you think those have got to go underground. Don't worry about it. Put them at the surface a uh, little bit above even and your citrus tree will do better in the long run. So don't worry about a few surface roots at the top. They're gonna be okay. We don't wanna suffocate the tree uh, with a whole bunch of soil over the top. Okay, so we've dug a nice wide hole. 
but we've tried our best to make sure that it's the same level as, uh, you know, that when we plant the tree, it will be at the same level as the existing ground. I think this is kind of uh, like the old carpenters, the thing carpenters say, right, measure, measure twice, cut once. Um, with digging for the hole, it kind of goes the same way. Dig and check more than once, that way you only have to, or yeah, more than once, so you only have to plant one time. Um, there's nothing worse than getting a tree into the hole, especially if you're planting a big one, and then realizing you gotta take it out and add some soil to that level under there. So make sure as you're digging that you have it at the right level, um, nice and wide. Pile the dirt that you take out of the hole out around the outside of the hole. We try to do it real neatly. We start creating that berm the second we start digging. So what we wanna do when we're doing our planting, especially for the citrus trees, because we're gonna to wanna to water them in well, is we're gonna have a nice dirt berm around the outside of the hole about three inches high. It's gonna hold the water in when we go to do our hand watering each day for the first month and beyond. Um, so as you're starting to do the digging, put that soil out around the outside and you start creating that berm right away. It'll save you a little time as you keep going through the planting process. So now we wanna take the tree out of the pot you know, for a bigger tree, obviously there's a little more work involved with it. For the five gallon trees, you can usually just pull them out real nicely. We'll kind of lay them on their side and just do it real carefully. We don't want to over disturb the root system. That's where trees go into transplant shock when the root system gets really uh, butchered at planting time. Um, so we want to take it out as carefully as possible without disturbing the root system. Then what we're going to do is we're going to check those roots around the root ball. Make sure there's nothing circling the pot and make sure that as many roots as possible are pointing outwards. Um, so I'll use like the edge of my clippers or a knife or even my fingertips and just rake along the outside of the pot and just get all those roots that were kind of touching the edge and pointing to the left, pointing to the right to point outwards. Because what are they gonna do when they start growing now? They're gonna grow outwards into that new planting hole that we've created. And that's important because we want a nice strong root system that's gonna support a strong, healthy tree in the long run. So get those roots pointing outwards now set the tree uh, into the center of the hole. Again, verify that you've got it level with the existing ground or even a little bit above. And now it's time to backfill with some good soil. As we said, our Florida soil is sandy, doesn't hold a lot of nutrients up, but we do need the tree to get used to it at least a little bit because none of us is gonna dig a 10 foot hole four feet deep, right? And backfill it with all good soil. That's probably a little bit of a overkill for planting our trees. Um, so they've got to get used to it. So what we're going to do is use a good rich soil. Our favorite is our custom blended Kirby's planting soil. It's a rich mix of both aged peat as well as new peat. It's got active microbes in it for good soil health. Um, pulverized pine bark for drainage as well as a little bit of water retention. And uh, then it has actino iron in it which uh, increases the green leaves and uh, root development as the tree starts off. So it's a really good mix of uh, soil, really rich for your plants. And we're gonna mix that in about half and half with the native soil. So that's the other reason that we piled that soil up around the hole as we were digging it, because now as we go to backfill the area around the root ball, we're gonna put in a little bit of good soil, pull in a little bit of the native soil, start to mix it together and compact it down as we go through the hole. And we just keep adding and compacting as we go until we get it level uh, with the existing ground. You should have a little bit of extra soil, like extra native soil left, and that's gonna make that dirt berm around the outside, okay? So that's planting 50-50 with a good soil to, um, to the native soil. If you do just native soil and you plop a tree in, oftentimes a year later, you'll pull that tree out and those roots didn't grow at all because they kind of started to grow and they said, uh-uh, that stuff's no good. There's nothing there for me. I'm gonna stay in this really good soil here. Um, on the alternate side, if you use only good soil, I feel like you just create a bigger pot underground. The roots grow for a while in that great soil, but they still get to an edge where it's like, nope, that stuff's really bad, this stuff's really good, that's where I'm staying. So that 50-50 mix allows the roots to get out there and slowly get used to the native soil. By the time they get to the edge of the hole, they're fine with it and they'll just keep on growing right into the native soil. So 50-50 for our soil when we're back filling the hole. And just as you're working around, make sure that you get rid of any air pockets that are in there. Um, there's always gonna be little bits of air in the soil as you pile it up. We wanna make sure to get as many of those out because the roots wanna touch soil. They don't want big pockets of air that'll dry them out underground. So we wanna make sure that we don't have any of those in our planting hole. So now that we've gotten it planted, we're level with the existing ground. Uh, we wanna start doing the, the kind of finishing touches of planting. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to water our tree. You guys are super exciting this morning. <laughs> um, we want to water our tree. 
definitely one of the most important things for caring for the new tree and also really important at this point. We've disturbed the root system. Um, the tree needs some help getting over that. So it needs plenty of water to kind of get its processes going again. And so right now is a great time to give it a really, really good soaking. That's going to be a planting time. You will see a variety of instructions, and I even want to say the University of Florida say this. They say to fill the hole halfway with water and then put your soil in and your tree in. That just makes a mess to me. You splash the tree in, you splash the dirt in. We like to get all the soil in there first. Then we're going to do a really good soaking, as long as you need to, to make sure that the tree is fully soaked and it's soaked beyond it as well. At this time with the water, we'll also use the hose kind of on like a medium strength to help us work any last bits of air bubbles that might be in the soil out. So as you start kind of watering the tree, you want to soak that root ball really, really well. Get it completely drenched all the way through. But also you'll take that hose and you'll almost water the, the soil area that surrounds the root ball. And what you'll see happening is all these bubbles come into the surface. And that's all those little bits of air that were caught down there. And what'll happen is the level that you have the soil at will suddenly sink like an inch as you do that initial watering. And that's great. That means you're wetting all that soil there for the roots to grow into, and you're getting ready to rid of any of the air that's hiding in there. So do that a couple of times, let it soak down. We're really, really, really gonna soak the tree this first time because not only is it important this first time, but every time that we water, uh, we want to water deeply. And that's why I kind of made the comment at the beginning not to rely on your lawn sprinklers. Because for lawns, we just we want to water a real shallow area of the surface, right? But for trees, we want that water to go way down. We want roots driving down so that we have a nice strong tree in the long run. So when you're doing your watering, either at this initial time or as you continue to water the tree, we want to make sure that it's a nice deep watering. That's what that berm is for. That berm's going to hold that water up against the root ball so that it soaks through right there at the base of the tree where it can really take up the, uh, the water well. In our typical Florida soil, an inch of water will soak through about a foot uh, in, in our soil. That's kind of an average. Um, and so what we're trying to do is not just soak that top foot of soil, which would take up most of the root ball, but we want water going down below that root ball continuously so that when the roots decide, hey, I'm a little bit thirsty, they'll grow a little bit. Plants are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They do things for a reason. So how many people have had roots that grew into your septic system of some sort before? Weeping willow, you know, just kind of tore up your drain field. Um, but the reason they do that is because there's water and nutrient there, right? They grow where they can find stuff. So your job when you're taking care of your new trees is to give them stuff they can find. So those deep waterings are gonna get water two and three feet below the tree so that the roots continue to grow in that direction. What happens a lot with new trees, we see it, especially like builder trees that get thrown into the lots where people aren't there to take care of them, is that the lawn sprinklers end up being the only thing that helps that tree survive. So if we're watering the top one foot of soil, where do you think the roots are growing? In the top one foot of soil, right? Uh, after Hurricane Irma, when different trees were pulled up, did you see a couple of different trees around where the roots were sort of like really, really, um, short like they just weren't it wasn't like a big deep root system it's just this really shallow root system and it just kind of goes whoop, it picks up that whole like one foot area uh from the top of the ground and that's what happens when the trees uh trees of any sort and citrus included aren't watered all that deeply the roots concentrate in a really shallow area they're just going to grow where they have the water if they never have it down low they're not going to go after it so you want to make sure that we water really deeply and a great time to start that is at this initial planting time wash that soil in soak the root ball really well and that'll get the tree off to a really really great start okay so now that we have watered the tree in we're going to do two more things to kind of finish up planting and the first thing is going to be to stake the tree. So we've done all this work uh, to get it planted with some great soil. And we also, uh, you know, we've packed that soil and the tree's nice and straight. What, what do we not want to happen? We don't want it to fall over, do we? And so we're going to use a stake, uh, for, especially for the smaller citrus trees. It can usually be something as simple as just a little, this is kind of like a plastic coated metal stake. Just something really simple. Drive a single straight stake straight down the middle. Uh, of the tree and then tie it in like two or three places with a flexible tie tape. You want to make sure that whatever you tie it with that is flexible so that as the tree grows it can push the tape a little bit to move with it. That way it doesn't girdle the tree which would be to cut into the bark. We don't want it to do that. So twine and things like that can be okay in a pinch but as the tree grows they can um, cause some issues on the trunk. So make sure to use a flexible tie tape when you're tying the tree up. 
And here's what's really important about staking. With staking, we're not trying to support the trunk. So we're not trying to create a crutch to make sure that the trunk doesn't break. More than likely, our trees are going to be fine through most windstorms that we get in terms of the trunks or the branches. What we're really trying to do is make sure that that new root system that we're trying to develop doesn't get disturbed by the tree falling over. So that's really what staking is done for. It's not to make a crutch for the tree. We actually want it moving in the wind a little bit. It kind of strengthens it each time it moves and sways with the wind. But we want to make sure that we drive that stake through the root ball and beyond about 8 to 12 inches so that it's supported really well in the soil underneath the root ball. And that'll keep it from falling over when we have a good windstorm. So make sure to do that with your new trees to keep all those new roots that you're developing uh, from breaking and you kind of have to start over every time the tree tips over. So the last thing we're going to do to finish planting up is get those roots going with what I like to do is our initial fertilization, and that's going to be with a root stimulator. Uh, a root stimulator is going to have a balance of nutrients that's good for root development. And who's ever made cuttings before? You dip the cuttings in like a little powder. That same rooting hormone that you use for cuttings is in the root stimulator as well. So uh, for a tree like the size of the smaller citrus here, we do about four tablespoons of the root stimulator in a gallon of water, mix that up really well, and then pour that over the root system. That's gonna give them a, a little bit more water. Make sure you do this after you do that initial watering or you'll just wash away all the fertilizer out of the root zone. Um, but it also, that hormone will bind to the roots underground, especially some of those that we've broken uh, just in the process of planting, and it'll help encourage them to grow a really good root system. Strong roots mean a strong tree over the life of the tree, so we really want to make sure that we get them off to a great start, and Root Stimulator can help with that. Okay, so that is the, uh, those are the basics of planting a citrus tree. Um, those kind of instructions actually go for a lot of your fruit trees uh, or even shade and flowering trees as well, so there's not much different for those. But now we're gonna talk about citrus care. So we're gonna talk about watering, fertilizing, and then probably the thing that most of you have questions about are gonna be different pests and disease issues uh, that come on our citrus. So we'll get to that um, and then we'll, you know, again, it's, like I said, after the seminar's over, we'll ha be happy to answer individual questions about uh, all of your citrus. I've always thought that I should at some point turn some of this seminar into like a little PowerPoint, you know, have like some visuals of citrus disease and issues. And then I realized that if I actually started telling you all the potential problems for citrus, you wouldn't want to plant any citrus. Um, because citrus do have a fair number of issues in our area, um, I kind of think it's a, it, I feel like it's related to just the number of citrus trees that there are in our area. Because we're a, a citrus state, it's an agricultural commodity for us, it's, there's a lot of production. That just means there's a lot of trees, and when there's a lot of trees, a lot of those pests find their way to it because they have a great food source. So as backyard gardeners, uh, we have to face some of those as well. So we'll start by keeping the tree happy and healthy because healthy trees do the, uh, are really good at resisting disease, resisting pest issues. So if we follow these first instructions for getting the new tree established um, and then just the basic care for uh, trees, I think they'll be healthier and that makes them resist a lot of those issues even more. So what do you think the first thing that we have to do is? We gotta water. Water, 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 water. Uh, a friend of ours owns a garden center in Dothan, Alabama, and he said something really funny in his newsletter recently, and it was uh, that he dares his customers to try to overwater their new trees. Um, and it's really tough to overwater a new tree. Um, most of the problems that we get calls about with new plants are that the tree just didn't get watered enough. It's always a first question. It's always the first question we ask if you have a plant problem. Okay, so the plant's not doing as well. How often is it getting watered? And we can usually tell by the response if it's actually being watered or not. Because if we get like a little dance or a defensive answer, we kind of know, okay, well, you're not going to admit to not watering it, but we kind of know where the problem is. So watering is really critically important. It causes a lot of the issues with new plants. And if you don't do it well for the first initial uh, period of establishment, the tree's always going to be a little bit weak because it just never gets established well and it's always struggling to sort of keep up. Uh, so we want to make sure our trees are as strong as possible. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to water our trees at what time of day? Morning. Always in the morning, okay? Trees do the major uh, use the majority of the uh, water that is on their root system during the day. When that's when the leaves are open for business and making food from the sun, that's when they want the water on their root system. So the best time of day to water them is going to just be 
uh, sometime in the morning. Doesn't have to be before 5 a.m. or anything crazy like that, but just make sure that the roots are really well soaked before the sun is out and hot on the tree. So really, uh, to me, any time before 10, 11 in the morning uh, is fine for most of your trees. Um, but you do want to make sure that you water in the morning as much as possible. Watering at night means that the trees are soggy all night long. And then by the next day, especially on a young tree, all that water that you thought you put on the tree, what's, what's happened to it? There's this funny force in our world, right, called gravity, and it pulls that water beyond the root system. So by the next afternoon when it's really, really hot, there's no more water left for that tree to get. How many people, you don't have to admit it, but I'm assuming that some of us have done it. You get into a wilt and recover cycle. It doesn't show up on citrus all that much, but something, who's ever grown a coleus and seen it wilt in the sun, right? The, the, I mean, they just wilt really quickly. So they're a perfect one to kind of show this example. But um, what I always say is you come home at night and your plant's wilted, so you water it. And it perks up a little bit and you go to work, school, wherever you go the next day. And the next evening you come home and the plant's wilted, so you water it and it recovers a little and this cycle continues of just wilting and recovering. Um, and that, if all you do is water in the evening, the plant never gets a chance to grow. It's always using all of its energy just to recover. You won't notice that wilt quite so much on citrus trees or most fruit trees for that matter, unless they are super, super dry. Um, but it still happens to them. They miss the water one day and then the, um, the next day, you think you've watered it, they miss it again and it just keeps going. So water in the morning, every time you water uh, and your plants will be much happier for it. All of your landscape plants as well. So your grass, if you've had fungus issues with your grass before and you uh, are setting your timer to run at 5 p.m. or later, kind of in the evening, you're doing the same thing for your grass. You're making it soggy all night, disease issues, fungus problems creep up. Change those timers to run in the morning and you'll hopefully have less issues with that uh, generally. So we always wanna water in the morning. And then our general rule of thumb for watering new trees is going to be to water daily for the first month, every other day for the second month, and about twice a week for the third month. Um, thereafter, so that 90-day period, especially on the younger trees, is kind of that initial uh, watering period. Typically, you'll be fine with one good watering per week on a citrus after that, unless it's super hot and super dry. So May is the perfect example. Those temperatures are creeping to 95, 96, 97. We haven't had any rain. The trees are probably going to be happier with a twice a week watering as opposed to just once. Um, but for most of the year, one good soaking on your citrus trees is fine. If it rains, should you skip watering in the morning? Probably not. This is a trick question a little bit. So. Um, we get the most calls with plant problems a week after the first really good rain in rainy season. Um, because everybody says, yes, it's raining, I don't have to water my plants anymore. And so whatever schedule they are on, they forget it. And all of a sudden, a week later, their plants aren't looking so great. And so we'll ask the question, you know, somebody calls and asks something about their plant. We say, okay, well, you know, how often is it getting watered? Oh, well, it rained. Okay, well, when, when was the last time that it rained? Huh. Well, I guess it was a week ago. And so in rainy season, we do get a lot of rain, but it's not absolutely every day, and it's not for all of us. Um, so if it rained where you work, double check and make sure it rained where you, uh, where you live, right? There was a funny meme on Facebook I saw this week that was uh, Florida, and it had the driver looking forward at a thunderstorm in the rear view mirror had sun, right? So Florida's funny. It'll rain really hard in one place and not in another. So only skip a day of watering if it's truly rained like two or three inches. That's going to be enough rainwater to really penetrate the root ball of your tree and go beyond it as well. Uh, we've kind of learned something here at the nursery that if the forecast says it's going to rain for the day and we're trying to make a decision on running our sprinklers and things like that, we can make it rain by watering and make it not rain by not watering. So if we make a decision in the morning not to run the sprinklers, by mid-afternoon the plants are all droopy because the rain's not coming. And if we do water, then it doubles down and we get an extra two inch deluge or something like that and it's too much rain. So if it's a brand new tree and the forecast says it's gonna rain but you haven't watered for today yet, I'm watering that new tree. Soak it pretty nicely and if it gets a little bit more from mother nature, that's okay. If like last night, if it rained two or three inches at your house, 
then it's probably okay to skip that day for watering. But be as consistent as possible. That's what the trees really want. Nice, consistent, deep waterings to encourage the root system to grow, uh, to get nice and big, and make that tree really strong. So keep it consistent. Only skip if we get plenty of rain. Uh, don't skip if we have just a little bit of a sprinkle uh, on those trees. So keep them watered. That's super important. Water is uh, kind of what does the heavy lifting in the plants, right? It takes all those nutrients that we're gonna put in the soil and takes them up to the leaves. It's what makes food and transports it through the system of the plant. So it's really important for them. And why are we growing citrus trees? To eat them, right? We want nice juicy citrus. What makes juice? I mean, what makes up most of juice? Water, right? So, uh, you know, there's problems for citrus associated with not having enough water, and one of those can be dry fruits. So if the tree is starting to struggle because it's not getting enough water, it'll often steal water out of the fruits in order to run its, its uh, natural processes so that it doesn't die. Um, and so we want to make sure that our trees are getting regular water to make them happy, healthy, and give us great harvests as well. Uh, but trees don't just need water to survive, they need some food as well. And so we wanna make sure we feed our citrus trees on a regular basis. That's kind of one of the problems with our Florida sandy soil is there's not a lot of natural nutrient in our soil for the trees. And so supplementing with some fertilizer is always important for keeping them happy. Uh, what we like to use is our custom blended Kirby Special. It's our 848 fertilizer, so it's a nice balanced fertilizer. It also has all of the minor elements. So if you go and research citrus, because you have uh, yellowing leaves or different things like that, you'll find there's a whole lot of different minor element deficiencies that citrus can suffer from. Uh, things like just not enough iron, uh, not enough magnesium, manganese, zinc, and different things like that. All of those nutrients in our, are in our Kirby Special Fertilizer. So it's a great uh, balanced fertilizer that you can use on a monthly basis in the first year to keep your trees nice and happy. And then we'll use it in spring, summer, and fall in subsequent years. Uh, so you don't have to do it every month uh, as the tree starts to grow a little bit. Whatever kind of fertilizer you're applying, I'd encourage you to use something like a granular uh, because you can spread it evenly around the base of the tree. So we don't wanna, when we're applying fertilizer, even to our small trees like these, we wanna avoid putting that fertilizer in just one big handful. Because as the water kind of activates those minerals and they move through the root system, at that point they're only moving through one part of the root system. We want them going through all of it so that one part of the tree, one part of the root system isn't encouraged to grow as much as some of the others. And so for the smaller trees, we're gonna use about two tablespoons of our fertilizer once a month. And we're gonna sprinkle it as evenly as possible just over the entire uh, root, root ball surface of the tree. And then as the trees grow, we'll fertilize all the way out to what we call the drip zone. So that's gonna be where the kind of branches end, where water would drip off of them. And so we'll spread that fertilizer evenly through that entire area. You know what, I didn't say that about watering because I realized I was starting to talk about watering too much. Um, but you also, when you're watering, you wanna make sure that you are watering the entire root system as well. So for a smaller tree, that dirt berm is gonna allow you to fill it up a couple of times and really get a good deep soaking over the entire root ball. But as the tree grows, make sure that that watering is covering the entire area. So you want two or three inches of water going through the entire root system, not just in one little spot uh, on those trees. And the same goes for fertilizer. We want a nice even spread so that all of the roots have access to the minerals. Uh, that way they can take them to different parts of the tree. So fertilizer is important. And then one other thing we'll do, we asked our growers one time how they get these really pretty flushes of growth on their citrus trees. And they told us it was through a minor element spray. So something you can do, especially in the spring to get a boost of new growth on trees. And I like to do it on a tree that, and when people ask, hey, I've got this tree, I've fertilized it, I've watered it, it's just not doing anything. We'll do kind of an additional boost of a liquid fertilizer. And you'll apply that as a foliar spray, which means you'll spray it on the foliage and I've got it over here, I think. So this one's our chelated liquid iron with other minor elements. Uh, and then this year, if you, especially if you like to do more organic and naturals, I've been using the Grow Big on some of mine at home, which is a great mix. I want to say it has kelp and earthworm castings and all sorts of good natural stuff in it as well. So that can be a great way to boost those trees. Do that a couple of times in the spring for really nice flushes of growth. And like I said, if you've been fertilizing, maybe it's an old tree in your yard and it's just not taking the fertilizer, you don't feel like it's doing anything, a liquid fertilizer can be a great way to get nutrients right into those leaves and see if that doesn't make a difference for an older tree that's been struggling for a while. So water and food. We need it, our plants need it too, so make sure that you do those, and especially through that initial period. The more you care for the tree for that first 90 days, the first six months, and even through the first year, the stronger the tree will be long term. Uh, two or three years later, if you didn't do that initial establishment well, the tree's always gonna be a little bit weaker and never quite as strong as you'd want it to be. 
and we need strong trees because as I said, there are quite a few pests and disease issues in Florida uh, that get on our citrus trees. The stronger the trees are, the more that they can withstand those, the more that a few bugs picking it a couple of leaves do uh, doesn't really matter for the trees. But especially on our new young trees, we do want to watch for bugs uh, and disease issues because we need the tree to grow a little bit before it can really resist some of those things. So not only is keeping the tree healthy and strong, I think really important, but also just being preventative, right? It's good for us too, right? We should probably diet and exercise before we have to go to the hospital with the doctor, right? So for our trees, we wanna preventatively keep those problems at bay. Um, one of the things you can do is spray something like a neem oil. I think I have those here. So neem oil is derived from the neem tree. It's both uh, an insecticide as well as a fungicide, and it's really good preventatively. Uh, but it's also organic, which means that it's just natural. You can spray it on the plants, and you can still pick the fruit and eat it without any concerns. Um, there are We're not going to talk about pesticides of any particular strong strength in this workshop, because my assumption is that most of us, if we're trying to grow stuff in our backyards, are trying to avoid the heavy pesticides that might be put on a lot of commercial fruit. Uh, but certainly there are, com there are stronger pesticides you can use for treating issues. Um, it's just not our go-to for uh, keeping our citrus happy and healthy. I love using neem oil. You can use it on a monthly basis uh, and keep the trees really clean. If you have a problem, you might step that up to weekly, um, especially in the spring. Uh, you'll see the most insect issues on your trees when the trees are flushing really well, and that's gonna usually be the spring season. Season Everything's starting to grow. Bugs love those tender new leaves. That's what they go after. So when they're in that period, spraying regularly is important to keep the bugs out and just keep disease from creeping in. And if you prevent problems in the first place, um, your trees will be much happier in the long run and you won't have to scramble to try to uh, make a tree recover uh, that's having really bad problems. We always hate trying to help people. Well, I mean, we don't hate it, we're happy to help it. Um, but they bring us leaves and so, oh, the whole tree looks like this. They're all eaten up and everything. And it's like, wow, you've got a little road to recovery here for this tree because we've got to get the problem treated and then we got to get a whole new set of leaves to grow out. So keep them treated early on and the trees will be much healthier in the long run. So the best way that you can, uh, besides spraying, the other thing you can do for your trees is just what we call, we call it in vegetable gardening is scouting. Get out there on a regular basis and take a look at the trees. Don't wait until months and months have gone by and you think, huh, I should go pot, you know, see if that tree's doing okay. You know, I like to go out in my garden in my fruit area you know, in the mornings, just walk with a cup of coffee or something. Morning's a nice time because that's often when you see bugs active. And the evening's also a good time as well. In the middle of the day when the hot sun is out, most of the bugs are kind of hunkered down and hiding. But early in the morning or in the evening at dusk, you'll see them a little more active if you're going to find them. Uh, but there's a couple of other signs on our trees that can tell us that we have an insect issue. Uh, how many people have ever had really black leaves? It's like a film that comes off their citrus or your gardenias or your crepe myrtles or your exoras or different things like that, right? So that little black film is called sooty mold. And although it's a mold, it's actually there because of the insects. So whatever insect problem you have, it's often aphids or scale insects of some sort. Um, those insects are feeding and they leave a residue behind called honeydew. That honeydew is what the sooty mold grows in. So whenever you see that sooty mold on any kind of a plant, it's a sign that you have an insect issue. Treat the bugs, that'll get rid of the food source for the sooty mold, and eventually the sooty mold will kind of dry off and flake, flake away from the leaves. Um, but if you see that, then you can go looking a little closer for insects. Bugs like to hide. Sometimes they're underneath the leaves, tucked really far into the brand new stem. So it can be hard to find them just at a quick glance. Uh, but sooty mold's always a sign that you've got uh, insect issues. How many people like butterfly gardening? Kind of a random question, right, in the citrus workshop. So butterflies are amazing. The life cycle's really cool to watch. Uh, but there's a particular butterfly in Florida, the giant swallowtail butterfly, that lays its eggs on citrus trees. And so if you see big chew marks on your leaves, especially the new growth, um, take a look and make sure you don't have butterfly caterpillars there. Um, they're actually a really cool caterpillar. They start as a little stripe thing, and then one of their instar stages, uh, they look like bird poop. Like it just looks like bird droppings right on the leaf. Um, it's, a, it's a very cool, very well camouflaged caterpillar. Um, but, uh, but they do host on most citrus trees. Uh, I know we keep finding them on, for some reason they like my Myers lemon and my navel orange, and they leave the other ones alone. Um, but you'll find those every now and then. Are they a pest? Well, yeah, if you're a citrus grower, right, they're probably a little bit of a pest. Uh, I'll, let, I'll leave it up to you to decide what to do with your caterpillars. Um, but they do host on the citrus, so you'll find them sometimes. Usually, especially once you've got a tree that's gotten a little bit bigger, 
you can share a few leaves with the caterpillars. You may not even notice it once the tree's six or eight feet tall. They'll probably just come in and feed on a few leaves and you wouldn't even notice that they were there. On the little trees, you'll start to see it because butterflies like to lay a lot of eggs, right? So that you can sometimes get a dozen or so caterpillars feeding. So that's another pest to look, uh, look out for on your citrus trees. Um, probably the most common pest that we see that we get questions about are the citrus leaf miners. Um, leaf miner, you'll see that on peppers and tomatoes as well. For the citrus, it's actually a little moth, kind of hides away under the leaves. Um, it lays its eggs on especially new growth, and then when the egg hatches, it burrows right into the leaf, and it starts making little tracks. So who's ever seen a citrus leaf with tracks running through it, right? That's citrus leaf miner. Super, super common. Um, there's no way you can prevent it completely because the moths just exist pretty much everywhere in our area. And so, um, but what you can do, the neem oil can help to prevent the moths from coming onto the tree in the first place. And then there's also another spray that we like, and it's organic as well. The active ingredient is spinosad. It's kind of a synthesized bacteria, and uh, it's called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. It actually kills a wide variety of insects, so it'll kill your aphids and your scale uh, and other insects that you may have on your trees. And, um, but it's also specifically listed for leaf miner. So, um, so you can use that, especially when you start to see leaf miner. Leaf miner is very, very common uh, throughout the area. It's gonna be normal to have it. With the, kinda like with the butterflies, once a citrus tree is healthy and at a certain size, the leaf miner's not gonna affect it as much. It's more of a problem on smaller trees that are flushing with all this new growth. The leaf miner gets at that new growth and it can kind of cover your trees. So you want to make sure that you uh, that you watch for it on your newer trees. Here's the good thing about leaf miner is that once the little miner, the larva form of that moth, is in a particular leaf, it doesn't go to another one. And so now the moths can lay lots of eggs. If you've had a bunch of leaves that have been damaged by that, you'll know that. Uh, so lots of eggs can be laid, but the eggs, the larvae don't jump from leaf to leaf. So if you have some really, really bad leaves, rather than trying to spray them back to help, I'll just pinch them off, dispose of them, and that at least gets rid of some uh, of the leaf miner. Treatments of these sorts are gonna be better at preventing the uh, next set of new leaves from having the issue uh, in the future. So leaf miner is really common. You're not doing anything wrong if you see it on your trees, um, but there are some treatment options for taking care of it to help the trees kind of get to a certain size where they can resist it a little bit better. Uh, aphids and scales can be uh, insects you may see on the citrus trees, and that they hide. Man, do they hide. Aphids are tiny, right? And you'll find them clustered up in the new growth. Scale insects will just kind of flat little fuzzy things that you might find on the leaves or under the leaves. Again, they're common bugs in Florida, and especially in the spring when it was drier before, that's when insects really like to be out. But when the trees are flushing with new growth, they'll be out there as well. There's one final pest that's really important that we want to look for on our citrus, and that's because it is the uh, vector, which is the word for it spreads, uh, citrus greening. So how many people have heard of citrus greening before? How many people have some questions loaded for me about citrus greening? Make me wade into controversial waters, right? Um, so the Asian psyllid is a little bit of a, a little tiny bug, not much bigger than an aphid, just real, real small. And it kind of points up, it's real, uh, it's unique in that it, its body kind of points up at 45 degrees angle off of the branch or leaf that it's on. Um, that bug in, in and of itself isn't any more damaging to the trees than aphids or scale. Uh, however, that particular insect does carry the citrus greening disease. And it's a bacterial disease, citrus greening is, that affects the uh, trees and um, so that bug spreads it from tree to tree. And so there is no cure for citrus greening. Uh, if you have citrus greening on a tree, you just have to get rid of it if it's not producing or anything like that. There's nothing you can do to treat it. Um, but what we can do with our trees that we know don't have citrus greening is do our best to make sure that they don't get insects on them, which will spread that disease to them. So if we're keeping up with like a monthly neem oil spray or some kind of an insect spray to prevent those bugs from getting in there in the first place, then that's gonna help us prevent the spread of citrus greening to, uh, to our trees as well. Um, probably not gonna help if you had a tree in your yard with citrus greening, um, but, uh, but because the bugs are gonna be so close, but just that's our best preventative measure is just keeping our trees free and clear of insects as much as possible to prevent the spread uh, of citrus greening. Citrus greening cannot be spread. You know, you could take a tree that had citrus greening and wipe the leaves all over another tree and it's not gonna affect it. It really is that bug that, that is the vector for it. It infects the bug and when they kind of go to feed on the new tree, that's how it gets spread. So that's a bug we wanna look for. And I especially like to look for those in my kind of morning and evening walks. That's when you'll see them active and out. And if you start to see those bugs, it doesn't mean your tree is infected because we just don't know how many trees in the area do actually have it. 
Um, but it's a good sign to make sure that you go ahead and treat the tree for insects. Kill the ones that are there and keep them from, you know, going off to other trees and, and uh, continuing to be in the area. So when we are doing a spray of a pesticide, whether it's monthly, weekly, or however often we're doing it, uh, this is something that we want to do in the evening. So watering, I harped on watering in the morning. For our sprays of any kind of an insecticide or a fungicide, we want to do those in the evening. We don't want to spray the trees when it's hot, when the sun is out, that can burn the leaves. Especially the neem, it is an oil. Um, and so in the middle of the day, it can elevate the temperature on those leaves and burn them. So we do want to make sure that we, uh, that we do those sprays in the evening. Um, what is an important bug? So we were talking about bad insects, right? But what is an important bug for fruit trees generally? Bees, yeah, we need pollination, right? We wanna make sure uh, that we have um, good pollination that's gonna give us great harvests of fruit. And so whenever you see bees active, regardless of what problem you're trying to deal with on your tree, take that night off. So bees will be active at particular times when the pollen's being released on our trees. And if we happen to notice that, we wanna make sure we skip that night, postpone spraying for a little bit until the bees aren't active anymore. That's important because although wind can pollinate citrus, the bees are much more active at doing it, much more deliberate. And so that helps us get the best harvest possible. And we wanna make sure that they're around as well. Um, and I would encourage you as well, I mean, insecticides unfortunately aren't all that selective for bugs. You know, we always have problems with butterfly gardens, right? Butterfly gardens get aphids and things like that. People want to know, hey, what can I spray on my butterfly garden that won't kill the butterflies? And it just doesn't, unfortunately, work that way. If they're bugs, they're bugs. And the same goes for good bugs like bees and uh, ladybugs and things like that. So if you do see good active bugs uh, that we know are, you know, predatory on other insects, it also might be a time to pause on doing some spraying, even when it's organic kind of uh, things. If we can get a natural cycle going where the ladybugs take care of the aphids, um, that's always much better than, uh, than having to spray anything at all. Okay, so that was a little bit about insects. Um, and then lastly, and I'll do this more broadly because uh, there aren't as many signs for it, but fungus issues can also be a problem in Florida. It's humid. We're